Selznick was worried about. Although when you see that, you wonder why he was so damn concerned about that. Um, but such was the nature of uh, what the studio heads were worried about and what audiences would think back in uh, 1949. Anyway, uh, the reason you're still here, and uh, we have the uh, pleasure now of uh, talking to a woman who knows more about this film uh, than maybe anybody else alive today. Uh, there for just about every shot and every moment of the making of the third man, ladies and gentlemen, Angela Al. Uh, 
And what about the method actors? No, that's a nightmare. I did work with Robert De Niro and on the John Frankenheimer one, which I think is the popular film called Ronin. And the first scene, he had a, a sandwich, a cup of coffee, and a cigarette. And I thought, I said to John, I don't think we better tell him. I just don't think. He said, no, you're absolutely right. You know, because he, he can't be told. You just have to go with it, and the editors have to, you know, match it where they can. Are there some directors who care much more about that than others, and some directors will just think, I, okay, I, I get it, it doesn't totally match, but the point is not to nitpick about these things, and other directors who are... Oh, yes, but today they don't care. I mean, if you say anything today and you say, well, you know, it doesn't match, you won't be able to cut in, I don't care, or the audience will never notice me saying, well, actually they might, but, <laughs> but, but no. Um, Carol... Carol was brilliant at knowing what worked, what matched, and what you could get away with. And he didn't know. He, he was not somebody that if you said it doesn't match, he wouldn't listen to you. No, he'd always listen. Then he'd, he'd know whether he could get away with it. He'd always be very good about it. And he had a great sense of continuity himself, did he not, about literally how scenes ended and how much smoke was in the scene and how much shadow was necessary in order to edit, in order to match an edit. Oh, he was brilliant at it. And as I said, well, when, when we shot the film, and then you'd see the rushes every day, and then the editor would have to push it together, and maybe two or three nights later, you, you'd watch a sequence. And some of the cuts in that in, in Third Man were very, very short. And you know, I'd get a nudge, and then, then you know, trim it or do something. And you'd see, how you could change the value of the scene by overlaying a line later or playing it on somebody else. He could remember everything, even when he said cut, he'd suddenly remember the smoke look good like it did at the station. And he'd say, you know, get get the bit out at the end on like it was the smoke. And no, no, he remembered everything, he had a prodigious <coughs> memory. I mentioned some of it uh, before the film, <laughs> some of the parts that I mentioned before the film that I actually got right. Um, what, um, uh, uh, Orson Welles, he arrives late, right? So you had to shoot some stuff uh, before he got there, and that was Guy Hamilton doing some of the shadow work, correct? Who was the AD? Yes. Guy, um, they were chasing Orson around Europe. He was playing games. They'd get to, they'd send somebody to Paris, then he'd flown to Rome. When they got to Rome, he'd flown back to Paris. <laughs> and eventually turned up, and the very first shot he did in the film, I was on, is when he walks to the camera in the Prater, the wind, and there was a, a little ca this carousel, and he, that was the very first shot he had to do. He came forward and he walked back. Then he left the country again and disappeared. <laughs> and, but I'll have to tell you the story of the, of the, of the, of the boy, of the stewards, because when it came time for him to do a shot in the stewards, everybody else would be down there, I'll be down there for weeks, but first Julie came down with the actors and he had to do his close-up. He came down and he saw the English crew eating their bacon sandwiches, <laughs> nearly had a sort of heart attack and said, completely, this is disgusting and everything else. And literally, he did the one shot, it was a close-up and he said, get stones, and then refused to go down to the sewer anyway. Everybody else did, I mean, Joe Cotton and everybody else. Um, and that's why we had to build, you know, much more of the sewers um, than they ever wanted to because it just wouldn't go down again. Um, and uh, so, uh, and originally, uh, David Salsa didn't even want Orson Welles. Thought he was, this is before you joined the production, thought he was box office poison. Uh, did you, was there a sense among the crew once Orson Welles was there? Uh, that this was the right guy to be working with? Well, I obviously, I think Carol felt so. Um, I mean... Yeah, I Carol, Carol insisted on him and ceded Selznick's wish to have, I think, Jimmy Stewart instead of Joe Cotton and said, well, I, I give you Cotton, but you give me, you give me what else. I mean, Carol normally, you know, got his way, um, might have taken a little bit of time with Selznick, who actually never appeared in Vienna. He never came on the shoot at all. And in fact, even Alexander Gordon, you know, who knew the city very well, but 
he, he stayed in London, so we never had any interruption from any of the, the major producers. Uh, they sent memos. <laughs> Oh, well, they may have yeah. said, but don't forget, in those days, it took a long time for the post, <laughs> and telephone wasn't easy because it was international. So, and we worked at you know, different hours, night, you know, the first year it was on night work. So, they couldn't sort of communicate the way they can today. Uh, the final uh, shot of Alita Valley uh, walking at, at the funeral, which the movie uh, concludes with, she is so far away and walks and walks and walks. That was a bold decision. Well, yes, I was on that shot because Carol came over, it was the day, because that's the, we were the day unit. Um, and he tried it, sort of a much shorter walk, then said, you guys, put it back a bit further. And then on the third day, he said, put it back even further, which they did. And he had the guts to hold it, because I can assure you, there was no coverage. I mean, you that know, it. yes, that was it. We did not cover it in any other way. When you watch the film, uh, I'm sure you've been asked this question many times, you watch the film, do you see, uh, do you see mistakes? Do you see things that you should have caught? Or do you see, nah, I nailed that one? <laughs> no, because as I said, I wasn't, you know, on all the main unit, and I think that you know, I've, I've seen it many times, but I, I think that Carol, you know, has cut it together, you know, wonderfully. And he certainly did do the editing. I mean, he was, you know, so quite heavily cut in the film. Do you know uh, exactly how many films you've worked on? Well, I think I looked myself up on IMDb. I don't know, I think it's in the 70s, but I'm not. I'm yeah, not it is. It's in the 70s, yeah. <laughs> um, I Google myself like three times a day. <laughs> I went over to Starbucks during the movie and Google myself. <laughs> no new information. Um, I'll let you know as it changes throughout the day. Um, you worked with uh, John Huston, I think, 14 times, is that right? Yes, I did 14 with him. Uh, uh, among, I suspect, the most uh, dramatic of those, most challenging, the African court. Yes, physically. So you got to go to Vienna and hang out in the sewers. That's, that's, that does sound like a wonderful vacation. Oh, I even got a badge, which I seem to have lost to the sewer police, because I was down there for about three weeks. Oh, and I think I should tell you that the wonderful, sh and it's sort of imprinted on my mind, we were downstairs and Carol came down to see whatever we were shooting. And I've never forgotten it. A waiter came down a spiral staircase in the sewer with in the full black long coat with a silver salver and a tiny coffee cup on it to give Carol his morning coffee. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't get it out of my mind. Uh, only the British would refer to the sewers as, I was downstairs. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the African Queen, so uh, uh, Bogart and uh, Hepburn, Robert Morley, uh, was it uh, challenging, obviously, physically, um, but uh, you got to work with some, uh, r obviously, r remarkable people. Um, uh, what was, uh, you know, what was Bogart like to work with? Oh, Bogie was wonderfully easy. Um, Katie Hepburn sort of allocated him his shirt and stuff, and that's what you're wearing, although, of course, John had approved it first, but, and then she'd say, go and tell him to learn the next scene, so I, go to both his cabin and say, do you want you to learn the next one? Oh, it's stupid. If I learn that one, I'll forget the one for tomorrow. And then she said, she wants the next one. You see, every job like that. And that was the first time they'd worked together. But, you know, they, you know, achieved the lifelong um, friendship. And she was amazing. And, you know, on that film, night, night, well, Bowie didn't have Betty with him, um, or Lauren McCall. But Catherine Hepburn came on her own. She did not have a secretary or a, 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 a companion. We all had to live, firstly, in um, these huts that made out of elephant grass in the Belgian Congo, 
then we lived on what we lived on a boat called the Lugard, which is kind of like I suppose a houseboat. And the cabins were very small, but everybody had the same. You uh, there's a I read that uh, there was a conflict about what Catherine Hepburn was wearing in a scene. And of course, there's nothing checked, there's no video, there's no Polaroids, it's just your word against Kate Hepburn. Yes, we, John said he wanted to pick up a shot on a sequence we'd done, you know, a few days or a week before. And so I said, well, you have to go and change. And she said, no, I don't. And I said, well, yes, you do. <laughs> and you were wearing the other, the other thing. And she, you know, it was a very formidable lady. Um, I mean, we did get off well with you after that, but I mean, she was quite strong, and I was, you know, very young. Well, actually, I was the youngest in the business. And I have to say to John Houston, you know, my eternal thanks, he said, that's Angie's job, so you go and change, Katie. <laughs> and I sweated blood till I got back to it. <laughs> Five weeks later to find out if I was right, because you, there was no telephone. I couldn't call the editor and say, is it right or is it wrong? No, no. No communication. And? And I was right. <laughs> <laughs> you did a little doubling work there, right? On the African Queen? Yes, because there were uh, no other females. There was only a, um, a wardrobe and a hairdresser, and they'd gone back. And the boat, somebody had to take the boat right down to the um, the base of the merch to the mouth. So I was the only person left. So I was, you know, had one dummy run with the captain of the Lugar, who was a very good man, who was saying to me, now listen, you can't go more than two feet left or right, because you'll go around. And there, lying sort of at the base of the niche, are these the most enormous crocodiles you've ever seen. <laughs> and you know, it's their territory with their mouths open. So it was, I was foolish, I was young, so I did it. <laughs> and of course you were paid extra. No, not a penny, not a penny extra. I had to do some other stuff, but nothing. Um, you know, I guess I was a fool. <laughs> uh, and uh, I guess I, I read the only other double you did was uh, Ava Gardner, is that right? Yes, I did, yes. Um, when I was on Pandora, the Flying Dutchman. Yeah. Um, Frank Sinatra was in town that evening in Spain, and she didn't particularly want to work late. So again, I was the sort of youngest, and so, you know, she was supposed to be sw swimming nude, so I was given, you know, some sort of costume and just told, you know, to swim around. So that was my job for that evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have very little time left, but I want to ask you one final question because I know you uh, also worked on the sort of uh, uh, tragically marred uh, Misfits um, uh, uh, with Clark Gable, Montgomery Clift, and Marilyn Monroe, final film for both uh, Marilyn and and Clark Gable. Uh, difficult uh, working with uh, Marilyn? Extremely difficult, yes. Um, she was, well, I guess everybody knows that she was always late. Um, she was on whatever drug she was on in those days. I think it was called Demerol, uh, so I was told. Um, she accused me of having an affair with Arthur Miller. <laughs> and as I said to Houston when they told me this, I said, you know, am I enjoying it as he spends 24 hours a day in a company? I'd love to know if I'm having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but, you know, she was so sort of, because I was the only person who was, you know, near her age, um, and she had to blame Arthur for something, because, of course, she'd had a big affair with Yves Montand, but before, so, you know, she could never be wrong. She was always perfect version, I think she was. <laughs> well, an interesting choice of words. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Clark Gable, uh, to the story. Oh, he was, he was charming, delightful, totally professional, and, um, you know, she was only asked to be on time for a shot for him one day, and she couldn't even do that, um, which really disgusted me. And I told Houston, if she doesn't go and say sorry to him, I personally will go and do it. So, you know, she sort of went like a five-year-old, sorry, Clark. <laughs> and he did come over after the shop and say, thank you, because I know you made this good. No, she, was, she was impossible, but, you know, what I do have to say about her on screen, she's magic, and, you know, you couldn't better her in some like it hot. So, 
not whatever my personal feelings professionally, oh, well, as she came out on the street, she drove directors, I think, to drink, but she did have an extraordinary personality. They were going to drink anyway, they were directors. <laughs> uh, is this the uh, how did the directors come on? Uh, is this the finest film uh, you worked on, or, or is it too hard to tell? I think it's certainly um, one of the best, but I, it's very hard, I think, when you work on films to ever really have a, a favourite. You know, it's difficult to say. And also, you know, Carol Reed and John Huston would have totally different styles, so it was fascinating to, you know, work with the two of them. And so many of the other directors, they all have different techniques. Angela Allen, thank you so much.